Yep, I've been um, asked to present on the topic of uh, visual assessment of fuel uh, for a fight behaviour prediction this afternoon, uh, and I'm hoping that uh, the things that I've got to say are going to lead on into um, the next presentation by Jim Gould, where he's going to look at uh, the basis for an Australian fuel classification. And so I'll be trying to set the scene for that. Um, I am going to begin with a, uh, a disclaimer. I'm going to be talking about work that's been done by a large number of people, many of whom are in the uh, room today. Uh, and they're from a, a wide range of organisations, but particularly from Victoria, Kevin Tolhurst, um, Greg McCarthy, Andrew Wilson, uh, and Francis Hines from South Australia, uh, Mike Browders and from CSIRO, uh, Jim and Phil and Miguel. Um, while acknowledging their important contributions, uh, they bear no responsibility for some of the things that I might say this afternoon. <laughs> so we'll get that out of the way. Um, what I want to do though is begin with an overview of how fuel contributes to fire behaviour and uh, briefly present a, a conceptual approach to thinking about uh, the role of the different layers of fuel uh, in, uh, in determining fire behaviour. I'm going to briefly review some of the important physical attributes of fuel and how they might change over time. I'll touch on the issue of uh, fuel load, and Phil's already um, mentioned that in his presentation this morning and how it's tended to dominate the thinking about fuels in Australia. Then move on to the concept of fuel hazard, what it represents, um, and particularly how it might be used in a practical sense to help us with predictions of fire behaviour. And then hopefully leave with some issues that uh, will prompt some further thought and discussion because I think that's very much what this uh, three-day session is about, is uh, about thinking uh, where we go from here. Um, so yeah, what's fuel's contribution to fire behaviour? Obviously it's very important in determining rate, uh, rate of spread and the intensity of fires. Uh, it's a key determinant of suppression uh, difficulty uh, at different stages of fuel development. Uh, and it also determines the resources that we will have to uh, apply to, to deal with suppression. Uh, we also use it to provide relative measures of bushfire threat and hazard in different vegetation types, and that goes to things like sort of planning assessments and uh, yeah, similar administrative and planning processes. And it's also important in helping us understand the, uh, the effectiveness and the frequency of treatment that we might have to apply to uh, maintain uh, some forms of hazard reduction treatment, whether that's by uh, prescribed fire or by uh, a mechanical approach. So I guess we can look at a hypothetical um, vegetation type. In this case, example is of a, a forest type. And you know, it's fairly standard sort of botany. I guess you can determine a, a number of layers within that vegetation type. Um, we can identify those layers and then think about how they contribute to fire behaviour. The contribution that each of those layers makes will uh, be determined by its state, things like its dryness and its compactness, uh, the burning conditions, so the weather conditions, and the intensity of the fire itself. And Phil, I think, mentioned the, uh, the importance of how a fire actually <coughs> integrates some of the, uh, the variability in fuels, and that is a scale-dependent phenomenon. And of course, prior to the fire, it's really only possible to make an approximation of what might be available as fuel. So if we look at the uh, canopy layer, obviously um, things like the, uh, the crown base height, the depth of the, uh, the green um, canopy layer, they're very important from a crowning point of view. Um, crown density and crown cover um, can be important in um, determining whether a a vegetation type is actually going to be able to support a crown fire. Um, if we think about the bark layer, uh, that's very important in providing um, both a, a ladder fuel that will carry you know, flames into the canopy and also it provides the bulk of the embers and firebrands that contribute to uh, the spotting process. The elevated fuel, and that's well, what we might think of as being comprised by tall shrubs and mid-storey trees, uh, that's very important because it adds to a flame height and it acts again as a ladder to lift the fuel um, into the higher layers, possibly connecting with smaller trees and eventually into the, the canopy of the forest itself. Generally with elevated fuel components we're talking about vegetation that has a primarily vertical sort of orientation um, and that can be very 
very spatially dependent. The near surface fuel, uh, essentially that's a layer of grasses, low shrubs, uh, suspended bark and leaves. Um, the characteristic thing really about the near surface fuel is that it has a very mixed orientation. We have both vertical, horizontal and stuff at all, all sorts of angles. And um, yeah, one of the key roles of the near surface fuel, which I'm going to talk about there, is its role in actually um, propagating the surface fire. Surface fuel there, we're talking about more a horizontal orientation. Uh, typically what we would think of as surface fuel is the, the layer of leaf litter on the ground. Um, the fresh upper component of that is likely to be contributing to the um, forward <coughs> spread of the fire, whereas the deeper, more compact layers, um, particularly where we have a, a duff layer developed, that is going to contribute more to, um, to flame depth and uh, burnout time. So I guess what that looks like in reality, typical piece of dry soil for forest, I think it's Jarrah Forest in southwest Western Australia that we can see each of those layers. So we've got our surface fuel there, primarily horizontal orientation. Near surface fuel, uh, in this case it's a mix of low shrubs, uh, grass tree, uh, quite a few bits of fragmented bark. I will mention the case here of the uh, Xanthria grass trees uh, and make the point that with this approach to fuels we're not tied to a particular approach for a, a given species, we look at what contribution it makes to the fuel. So in this case, we've got that low xanthorea, we would be con considering that fuel layer to be part of the near surface fuel layer because of its orientation and the role that is going to play in supporting a fire. Whereas the, his tall brother next door, there's a clear separation there between the, the ground layer and the near surface and the dense skirt of fronds there and the main contribution that that fuel is going to make is to increase flame height. And then of course we've obviously got our, our bark fuel. So if we then, I guess, consider how that uh, actually burns, and this is a fire just burning under moderate fire danger conditions, we can clearly see there that the, the near surface fuel and the upper parts of the surface fuel are the main layers that are actually supporting the fire spread. Uh, the role of the bark here really is um, as a ladder fuel to be extending the flames up the, up the trunks of the trees. So thinking about some of the physical at attributes of fuel, um, the way in which a fuel bed burns, what we might to perhaps refer to as flammability, it's a function of a range of physical prop uh, properties. Uh, those can include uh, properties of the individual fuel particles and that might be the thickness, uh, their propensity to exchange moisture, uh, their waxiness or their oil content, um, the way in which those particles are arranged, in particular their horizontal and their vertical continuity, and also their density and uh, compactness. Proportion of light and dead fuel uh, in the fuel bed is obviously very important, um, as is the, the height of the, uh, the different layers in the fuel stratum. Measuring particle and fuel bed properties is, is possible, although for those of you who have done it, which is probably the majority of the people in this audience, it's time consuming, it's complex, and in many cases it's pretty mind numbing. So uh, also the potential combination of properties when we look across the range of vegetation types is immense. And so from a fire behaviour modelling point of view, uh, whether that's been based on field or laboratory studies, we've generally sought to characterise fuel using a limited number of properties uh, that can be estimated with you know, relative ease. Fuels are also dynamic and they can change over time scales ranging from seasonal to multi-decadal or even, even perhaps over scales of centuries in some cases. Um, in ecosystems that are subject to stand replacement fires, uh, the fuel properties will tend to be clearly linked to stand age. Examples there might be uh, shrublands or perhaps some of the tall eucalypt forests which don't routinely have uh, uh, mild fires burning underneath the canopy. But in eco ecosystems uh, that have an overstory of uh, fire tolerant trees or other vegetation, the coupling between stand age and fuel age may be quite weak, uh, with fuel age determined primarily by the time elapsed since the last fire. And so typical open eucalypt forests uh, and some of the grassy woodlands would be good examples of that. 
A number of field properties can change over time, including the, the field load, uh, the size class distribution, uh, the proportion of live and dead uh, within the mix, and the way in which those fuel uh, particles are arranged structurally. Phil touched on this this morning, but um, I'll uh, go over some of that ground as well. The, the forest fire behaviour guides that were developed for eucalypt forest in the 1960s from field experimentation um, have used fuel load as really the sole physical measure uh, of the fuel bed. While some allowance is made for fuel contributed by understory shrubs, particularly in the, the West Australian forest fire behaviour tables, um, that is still converted back to a fuel load equivalent um, with the assumption being that that material will increase the rate of spread and intensity of the head fire in the same manner as an equivalent amount of surface fuel. And both the MacArthur Forest Fire Danger Meter and the WA Forest Fire Behaviour Tables incorporate relationship, which I've got there in that figure on the right, um, that predicts that doubling the fuel load will double the rate of spread, leading to a fourfold uh, increase in fire intensity, other factors remaining constant. Interestingly, when you go back and look at George Peake's experimental data, he found a stronger correlation between rate of spread and fuel bed depth than he did uh, with actual measured fuel loads, but he, he used fuel load in his model. Coming on to the concept of fuel hazard, uh, and this really arose from work done in Victoria, um, initiated by Andrew Wilson back in the, the early 1990s. Um, and he started that work looking at bark and with, uh, with elevated fuel. And his definition of uh, fuel hazard, which I'll put up there but I'll read it out, is that it reflects the current condition of the fuel and takes into consideration such factors as quantity arrangement, current or potential flammability and the difficulty of suppression if the fuel should be ignited. Um, and essentially those factors, the fuel hazard approach combines those factors into a single rating um, that's generally been in the form of a categorical rating for low, moderate, true to extreme, which you'll be familiar with from, I guess, the fire danger uh, scale. With the Project Vesta experiments, we adopted a similar approach, which is based unashamedly on the Victorian approach, but then we used a, uh, a numerical hazard score. And um, I guess subsequent to those experiments, we've actually worked quite closely with Greg and Kevin to align those two systems more closely um, so that the, the latest version of the overall fuel has applied incorporates a number of um, or considerable amount of investor information and provides both numerical and um, categorical uh, hazard descriptions. Um, fuel hazard is correlated with fuel load but it's not an exact fit. Um, and the work that was done in Victoria, or this being done in Victoria, clearly linked the concept of fuel hazard uh, to the probability of the first attack success for a defined set of uh, conditions. So most of you probably would have seen or possibly worked um, with these descriptive charts, and I won't labour the point, I'm not here to sort of provide a training session on that, but essentially with um, the hazard approach, you have descriptive rating, hazard ratings, um, you know, ranging from low through to extreme, there's a description of what are the key attributes of each of those, those classes, um, photographic descriptions to assist people um, in interpreting those descriptions and visualising what the different um, categories might represent, and then a table or a, a column that gives you some idea of the um, equivalent available fuel load. And so in this fuel hazard can also be used to describe changes over time um, and in general um, the patterns that are exhibited are quite similar <coughs> to those for um, the accumulation of uh, fine fuel load. In this example, uh, which is based on the near surface fuel layer in Jarrah Forest, uh, we can also use it to present slightly different patterns of accumulation of hazard um, over time for forests with a, a low understory type, which is the green line, and uh, for one with a, a taller understory type, which is the, the blue line. I guess some of the considerations um, in using 
the hazard rating approach. Um, some, certainly some desirable attributes. Um, the outputs are generally meaningful to users. Um, most people can readily identify with the concept of fuel hazard and what it's actually telling them about the fuel and its flammability. And it's readily applied in the field setting. Um, not a lot of measurement involved. There's some basic training and interpretation and verification most people can pick uh, this approach up quite quickly and make sense of it. <coughs> To properly assign a hazard rating, no, it is necessary to examine the full potential range of hazard uh, for that fuel type. Uh, if you don't do that, then you run the risk of stretching that scale over only part of the actual range of variability and coming up with uh, results, uh, with assessments that are not true for the fuel type. And because we're lumping a number of those different characteristics in, there are numerous uh, interconnections and inter interdependencies. Um, and hence there is a need for consistency in application and for measures to ensure that you know, the, rating, you know, the ratings are applied consistently. Training is obviously important on there and I draw your attention to the work that Penny Watson and her colleagues did which um, looked at some of the variations between systems and between observers for well, that particular um, that work. I guess um, one of the things that the Project Tester experiments did was that they took the concept of fuel hazard for next step and actually demonstrated um, that various measures of fuel hazard were strongly correlated with fire behaviour and therefore could be used as inputs uh, to a fire behaviour model. Uh, so here, and this is a slide from the uh, FBAM course, so I probably <coughs> recognise some of the people in the audience. Here we're looking at uh, the effect of changes in uh, surface fuel hazard, the near surface fuel hazard, and the near surface fuel height uh, for fixed values of the other two variables. And essentially what that's saying is that the effect of near surface fuel hazard is much larger than the effect of the surface fuel hazard um, on rate of spread, and larger again than the effect of the near surface fuel height. Um, and so that is, uh, yeah, this is the primary area of the, uh, the best of all. Um, if we look at the, the sensitivity um, to different values of fuel hazard, uh, this chart shows the effect of um, near surface fuel hazard um, on the rate of spread for, uh, for different wind speeds. Um, generally, doubling the wind speed is doubling the rate of spread. So, going from the low fuel hazard, we're going from about 275 up to 540 metres an hour. And similarly, for the extreme fuel hazard, we're slightly more than doubling the rate of spread for that. But for each of those wind speeds across the range of um, hazard ratings, there is about a six fold increase in the rate of spread. And so that really emphasises the importance of consistency in assignment of hazard ratings to obtain correct estimates for making our fire behaviour prediction. So if we're out by a couple of classes in our fuel assessment, we're likely to be out by a significant amount of our estimated rate of spread, particularly the stronger winds. I guess the question arises as to how we can use uh, fuel hazard ratings to predict fire behaviour when fuel information is limited, as it mostly is during the initi initiating stages of a, a fire response. So, for forested areas in uh, southwest WA, a product we've developed is a, uh, a map that actually stratifies the, the southwest forest into four broad forest ecosystem types, and they reflect rainfall potential, that transpiration, some landfall and soil characteristics. And that's also been intersected with time since fire, which are the different uh, colours there. So I think you're going from the, the green is most recently, the brown is most recently burnt through to uh, the other colours, which are longer time since fire. And effectively, what that map is doing is providing some default um, values for each of the fuel parameters that you fuel hazard parameters that you would need to make a rate of spread uh, prediction. So for the surface 
fuel hazard near surface fuel hazard and near surface fuel height for each of those four ages we provided in default. Um, and that's been based on um, fuel sampling and verification. So according to need and resources, that approach could be refined to provide a, a finer resolution of uh, vegetation map, um, so we can do more to perhaps uh, tease out the characteristics of shrublands, plantations, meat interface build plots. I would say this product has been received pretty well by our uh, operations staff, um, and we do update it twice a year now to reflect changes in uh, fuel age as a result of uh, burning and fires. I'll just touch briefly on some uh, other aspects of Paul. This is uh, some work that uh, Paul DeMar will be talking about on Wednesday. Um, but yeah, I guess other ways of presenting visual information about fuel hazards, um, short rotation plantations, in this case it's Tasmanian blue gum, they provide a good example of a fuel type where your characteristics are very <coughs> cut, closely coupled to, to stand age. Simple, develop, uh, simple pictorial fuel guide was developed to characterise the change in stand characteristics and fuel characteristics uh, over the you know, decade or so rotation is common with uh, blue gums. Um, so the guide provides a general description of stand characteristics for each stage of development. Uh, there are some representative photographs, descriptions of stand characteristics, um, and some you know, general descriptive information about the fuels. Um, this is largely in a, a text-based based format. Um, I see this approach as having some considerable strength its simplicity. There's a low cost of development and um, updating as you get additional information. It's a useful product for training and education and it is ex accessible, readily accessible to non-specialist users such as uh, private tree growers. And a similar approach has been fired in uh, Pinus radiata plantations there um, with the added um, value there of actually providing numerical um, measures of flame height and rate of spread based on simulation of the uh, plantation fire model developed by the girl, but I'll, I'll leave Paul to talk about that in his presentation. So just some issues for uh, further thought and discussion. Um, I think we need to consider how the concept of fuel hazard can be applied consistently across the full spectrum of fuel types. It's, I think, well established for dry forests. Had some application uh, in Mali and other shrublands through the work of the NARCA experiments. But I think there's a need for further work in uh, particularly grassy forests, uh, wet forests, and in some of the discontinuous uh, fuel types such as the grasslands. And particularly, I think there, um, there are some questions as to how do we correctly assign different layers to um, the existing uh, layers of uh, hazard. <clears throat> I think we need to also consider um, whether there might be a drift in assessment as time goes by. I guess there'll be a turnover of um, the original people that developed these systems. Um, most of us are probably not going to be here in the next um, 10 years, so I think there is a risk of drift there, so that could happen through changes in personnel or changes in agency interpretation or even through sort of subtle modifications of the descriptions. And thinking back to that slide that looked at the sensitivity of the fire behaviour outputs, um, I think that is a potentially significant issue that we need to consider. And I think more broadly, we also need to look at how the concept of hazard fits within a more universal description of fuels, particularly in a national or in an international <coughs> context uh, that might be applicable to the next generation of fire models. Hopefully I've used up all my... Um, so I don't have to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you.